As he mentioned, there are quite a few of us. Uh, we're a collection of cancer biologists, computational biologists, computer scientists, data scientists. Uh, I think I can do it here. OK. Um, and uh, we're working together to basically speed up the uh, speed of scientific discovery. Uh, we have a data problem in the biomedical uh, fields. We currently have about 25 million papers in PubMed uh, covering diverse topics from you know, very specific biology areas to disease. Uh, every year, an over another million papers gets published and added to the bed. Topics such as breast cancer covers over 250 million uh, 250,000 articles all by itself. So you could see how if you're a breast cancer expert, that would be rather problematic. Uh, proteins such as P53, which is a key cancer protein, already has about 70,000 proteins specific to this protein. Every year, another 4 million is added. And so if you could imagine you're trying to be a P53 expert, how do you keep up with the field? So we need to keep up with the literature. That's the goal of our project. So for us, we're trying to take this unstructured data literature, turn it into structured information, basically represent this information in various structures so that we can reason on them to be able to identify novel hypotheses that are useful and interesting to the community. Validation is a really key step for us because along with doing computational validation, what we really want to do is take our predictions, send, send them to the laboratory, and have, you know, basically have students and postdocs and scientists work on these predictions in order so that they can make discoveries quicker. As a test case, we first focus on protein-protein interactions. Okay, so what's a protein? Well, uh, protein is basically the cellular machinery, this is how pretty much everything happens inside of us. Uh, it basic, proteins regulate uh, the making of other proteins. They decide when protein uh, cells are made, when cells die, so on. Over here, what I'm trying to show you is a set of experts sat down and said, this is how we think signal transduction happens in apoptosis. When you see this, it starts to look a little bit like a graph, right? All these little strings here are various proteins, and you have edges here that basically say that these proteins work together for <laughs> these functions. So it starts looking really familiar to anybody who likes graph theory. But what you don't realize is <laughs> this is somebody's lifetime of knowledge. Thousands of papers went into reading thousands of papers to get to this picture. And so each of these connections are actually, it can be represent one paper or maybe 100 papers where somebody sat down and basically understood the connection between these two proteins and understood exactly what this connection implied. You go to the, uh, actually, there's something down here. You'll have to trust me, but I luckily have it here too. Here's an example of a sentence that appears in a science, tape, uh, science paper where we have APC regulates beta ketenin phosphorylation. And so that's the reason why that appears in that network. So part of our goal is to, when we're working with IBM, is to use Watson technology to get to these key sentences so that we can automatically build these graphs. But even above trying to build these graphs, we want to identify novel hypotheses. And in this case, I'm going to talk a little bit about our applications of graph diffusion and non-negative vectorization to identify new interactions between proteins. Uh, I will go over some of the uh, validations that we did. We had compared to various gold standards, and we also implemented an a, a time-stamped analysis so that we can kind of show that we're not tricking ourselves. But really, what we're trying to get to is this lab validation. And unfortunately, this is still ongoing, but uh, we will expect to have papers soon. At this point, uh, Mina will take over and tell you a little bit about the text extraction. Here you go. 
So I'm going to describe some of the details behind going from literature to a structured representation. Um, all of this uh, extraction technology is built on the IBM Big Insights product. Um, System T is the information extraction engine, and underlying that is the English slot grammar parser, ESG parser. You may have heard of it. it was used in the Watson Jeopardy game as well. Um, and this, was, this is the technology that's powering all of the information extraction, knowledge acquisition that's going on here. So there are three key steps in our process. First is identifying entities, and entities for us, uh, like Angela mentioned, are genes and proteins. Uh, the second key step is identifying if there is an interaction between a gene and a protein, and then if so, what is it? And trying to organize this in a um, uh, map that makes sense to the expert. And finally, representing uh, this network before we proceed to hypothesis uh, discovery. So let's jump right in into um, entity recognition. So what we're after is identifying genes and proteins. Uh, this work is backed by a dictionary of genes and proteins that our subject matter experts helped us curate. Uh, so we have about 340,000 gene protein entries. All of these are only human uh, genes and proteins. And they all map to canonical names. Think of those as unique identifiers uh, for a gene. And all of these have been curated from well-known biology sources. So the first step here is to use this dictionary to do entity recognition, to try and spot uh, potential genes and proteins in text. There are three ways that we're doing that. Uh, this, the first one is uh, simple dictionary matching rules. Um, if an entity that is found in uh, our gene protein dictionary is also found in text, allowing for fuzzy matches. For example, if there's a space missing, hyphen missing, parentheses missing, we allow for that. Um, and to be able to catch that entity. Um, next are pattern matching rules, uh, which um, are motivated by the fact that there are genes and proteins that may never make their way into the dictionary because they're so new uh, and exploratory, but are being talked in literature, and we don't want to miss that. So uh, this set of rules catch, um, for example, words that are capitalized and followed by the word gene or followed by the word protein. The third set of rules are abbreviation matching rules. Often we find that in the title, the, user will, the um, author will say uh, expanded name of the gene followed by the abbreviation, but later in the abstract, he will only use the abbreviation, and the abbreviation may not be found in the dictionary at all. And so what we want, uh, are trying to do here is make an association between the expanded name and the abbreviation so that we can catch the abbreviation every time it's used um, in any of the machine reading tasks. This gives us a huge set of entities to deal with. Often there are false positives. Um, I'll give you an example. SCD is a very popular gene name, but it's also an abbreviation for sickle cell disease. So what we want to do at this stage is disambiguate um, gene mentions from non-gene mentions. And uh, we're using very well-known technology here, using features in a sentence, looking at words before and after a gene mention to identify if something is um, uh, an entity of interest or not. Perhaps the most important task in this uh, workflow is identifying the canonical name of a gene. And the reason this is important is because genes have been referred to uh, using several synonyms. And unless we don't map to a canonical, it's not possible to uh, look at the entire interactome um, in perspective. So, um, for example, if uh, you consider the gene D1, it maps to two different canonicals, um, DRD1 and LMOD1. And it's important to identify if the abstract is referring to one or the other. Uh, the problems go deeper. Often there are, um, this is a case of a single gene referring to multiple canonicals. There are often cases where multiple canonicals will point to the same gene. Did I say that? Yeah. Um, uh, so the what we're using here is, again, very well-known technology. We're building uh, unigram context models for the canonical names and the proteins to identify uh, the, max, the, the, the probability that uh, this canonical goes with that uh, protein name. So at the end of this process, we have identified genes and proteins. The next step is to see, um, are there any meaningful connections between them? Meaningful connection for us is what a subject matter expert tells us is meaningful. So we're not after verbs such as follows, suggests, or you know, regular English verbs. What we're after is particular protein-protein interactions. And the way we got to this is uh, using multiple sources. Some of them come from um, gene ontology and uh, prior efforts in bioinfer and bioNLP. Basically, these are shared tasks and efforts where uh, researchers have uh, curated hierarchies and words 
that go into these hierarchies to represent protein interactions. Um, another source of um, data for curating this uh, dictionary, if you will, is coming from our subject matter experts themselves. They took about 400 abstracts and labeled them for the interaction and the canonical name. So at the end of all of this process, we have this um, dictionary of about 70 types. Um, uh, the left column is showing you the canonical name of the relationship, and the rest of the columns are showing you terms. So uh, let me read one out if it's uh, really small uh, to read from the back. So modification is a uh, canonical type or a t relationship type. And there are the terms under it may be uh, terms like modification, convert, process, cleave, hydrolyze, so on and so forth. What you're not seeing here is variants of these terms, the noun forms or, um, uh, you know, phosphorylation has a variant called monophosphorylation, right, biological variants. We have those listed as well. We did not use stems because we found that to be problematic in this domain. So um, here we are. We've built this uh, relationship uh, dictionary to use for identifying protein-protein interactions. So the uh, algorithm for learning PPIs uh, bootstraps from uh, training data that I mentioned previously. In addition to annotating the actual interaction in an abstract, um, our collaborators also annotated what the subject and the verb, or uh, subject and the object of this interaction was. So in this network, all we're inter interested in is extracting these subject, verb, object triples, right? Nothing, nothing more complex. Um, so if you read that example on the top left corner, that's what our training data looks like. So it says ATR phosphorylated P53 at serine 15. And the things of interest are ATR, which is the gene that is causing the interaction phosphorylation. It is called, that interaction is happening on the gene P53. So our goal is to be able to extract this triple. Uh, the way we uh, go about this is go through all of the um, label data and the 400 abstracts and learn syntactic connections between the genes and the interactions. So for this simple sentence, if you send it through a natural language parser, um, uh, pick your favorite, the Stanford language, uh, natural language parser, for example, you will see an output like that. And what this is telling you is the interaction phosphorylated is connected to ATR via the subject relationship and to P53 via the object relationship. And so we are learning that this syntactic uh, rule is relevant in extracting a triple. Now, that sentence is the most simple sentence you will find in an abstract. There are s terribly complicated sentences in biology, for example. You will find ATR mediated the phosphorylation of P53, for example. And now your parse tree looks different. You have to read it differently. The rules that you learn are also different. Right? So that's our training phase. We go through identifying genes, identifying relationships, learning these rules. And then we take these rules and run them through the 22 million pub odd PubMed abstracts. So we take these abstracts sentence by sentence, find the gene, find the interaction, uh, uh, parse them, look at the tree, and see if the rules match any of the ones that we had learned before. Um, you, can, you, you would think that this is restrictive, but uh, redundancy of expression is uh, uh, so well known in uh, literature that this helps us um, extract tons of relationships, even with just this limited um, uh, uh, learned rules from 400 abstracts. So here are some examples. Um, we learned rules that are direct interactions between proteins. So the first two are direct interactions. MDM2 inhibited P53, P53 negatively regulated notch one. Uh, another th kind of rule that we learn are these secondary interactions or indirect interactions that are not directly between proteins but between processes involving those proteins. And this is a differentiator of this work and is also very important if you think about the second slide that Angela presented where she, where she showed you a huge pathway. This is really the first step towards getting to that pathway, because you're not just saying that BCL2 induced P53. You're saying BCL2 induced P53 dependent apoptosis, and now you're starting to draw more things or fill more things in that pathway graph, if you will. OK? And so um, you put all of these uh, extractions together, and that's our um, huge network that we've extracted from 24 million abstracts. Here are a few statistics. So you got about 170,000 unique triples. Um, 
and uh, across all of these uh, relationship types. These then become inputs to our hypothesis uh, discovery process that uh, Angela will explain to you. Okay, so most of it's up there. Um, I was going to digress and tell you a little bit about what we uh, presented here last year at KDD, uh, because it's actually very relevant to this work. Um, our goal last year was to identify new P53 phosphorylators. And so basically, I'm looking for a certain type of protein that phosphorylates P53, where phosphorylate is just a very particular type of chemical reaction. Uh, in order to do this, we built a text similarity network where basically the nodes here are proteins and we extracted the edges. Uh, as several people have already mentioned bag of words today. We also find bag of words very useful and we've also implemented the text frequency index document frequency. So now we have our network. Well, there's something we also need to have label information. In this case, the label information is that we know that certain proteins phosphorylate P53, and we want to find the ones, one, new ones if possible. But one of the things with validation is we want to be very careful and not accidentally bias ourselves. So we did a time-stamped analysis. We basically created the same network but only used data up to December 20, uh, 2003. So we only used text from uh, up to that date. We only used label information up to that date. And then we have a positive set where basically these are the proteins that were found to phosphorylate P53 after December 2003. It turns out we have about 10 labels to work with, and we have about nine proteins that act as our positive set. Here over, uh, so basically after you, you know, diffuse your labels, I'm showing those little lighter greens. Those are, you know, where the information diffused to. Those are our hypothesis. And so now we have a score of how likely each of those proteins are to be a P53 phosphorylator. It turned out that about seven of the nine proteins that, uh, that were later discovered actually were very highly ranked. And so this was a very encouraging result, and we felt confident to move on to actual experimental uh, lab results. Uh, at this point, um, I know this may just look like little black blobs to you, but what I'm showing is that two of our high predictions here basically showed that they both bind, two of our top predictions bind and phosphorylate P53. And actually, one of the interesting things about this is that you can see over here, we kind of have this, you know, Lou right here. Actually, these things that appear to be false positives actually are over here, and they actually do turn out to be true. And so, in a way, we're actually doing better than we realize. Uh, one of the caveats of this work was we relied on a lot of manual curation. I'm showing here Larry here because he's our P53 expert. Basically, we ask him what proteins phosphorylate P53. He can write it all down, tell us the papers and everything. And I actually double checked him with the literature search, and he was pretty accurate. Um, but now, with all the everything that Mina talks about, we can actually shift and basically completely pipeline this whole thing. We don't need manual curation. We can use uh, the, tech, the relationships that we found extracted from the text. And here we are. We're basically going to repeat that experiment. Uh, we basically reconstruct our network. This time we chose 2006 just because we had a lot of data before and after in just the right places. Here's an example again, a new protein, ATF2. And again, we could identify the proteins that were found later very early using this method. Uh, one of the nice things is this turned out to be actually quite scalable. Here I am uh, implementing it on 58 different proteins. I have here basically this axis is the area under the receiver operator curve. And this is random right here, and basically about two-thirds of the proteins that we looked at had enough data to, tell, to give us a significant area of the curve. And this is very encouraging because this leads to tons of hypotheses that we can use. 
And so this basically shows A, our text tracks direction was good, but B, graph diffusion is a useful technique for identifying new interactions. In the next experiment, we looked at, we took this data, reconstructed it into a network, which basically kind of gets put into a, uh, we end up putting to an adjacency matrix. We used uh, uh, matrix factorization to then compress this network into our WH, our, our latent factors, multiplied them both out, which gave us kind of a theoretical network to work with. And this theoretical network pointed to new possible interactions, new hypothesis to compare to. So what's important here is that we needed to compare to a gold standard because uh, and we went completely orthogonal. We went to a database, a string database. It's a meta database of other databases. And it collects, at this time, it collected about 130 protein, protein interactions. A lot of this data is high throughput, which is also kind of low confidence. But we you know, still wanted to have some sort of positive set. And you can see here. We've had a very good predictive power here. Our area of the curve is around 0.7, but what really stood out is we do really well early on, pointing that our hypothesis using matrix factorization matched up with the golden standard really well. So this shows not only that you know, our text mining is good, but that matrix factorization is a very useful algorithm for identifying new hypotheses. Um, this is my last slide, I promise. Um, <laughs> Uh, in a last experiment, we wanted to kind of repeat our timed, uh, time-stamped analysis. So we basically took our graph and broke it up into pieces uh, based on time. We had the first 80% of things that happened after the 20, second, uh, the last 20%. And so we repeated the matrix, matrix factorization on the first 80% and let the uh, last 20% identify the act as a positive set. And we basically could find <laughs> that our subgraph could project things that happen later. And even when we looked, I'm going to flow through this, even when we looked at specific types of interaction, we saw these same trends. And even interactions, even networks that were made off only of you know, a thousand uh, edges, they actually also had predictive power. So again, this shows uh, that our pipeline is useful and that uh, matrix factorization is very useful to us. Oops. And in summary, we have a uh, complete pipeline. Uh, the algorithms were scalable to many proteins. We have ongoing experiments in uh, labs to uh, further validate these. And our next goals will be moving on to uh, drugs and diseases because we really uh, and doing hypothesis and around those entities with the idea that we're going to get to personalized medicine. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd be glad to take any questions. If we have time. We have time for one quick question before the next speaker sets up. A question? Yes. And please, the next speaker, please go and set up your computer. Thanks, guys. That was a really fascinating talk. Um, you mentioned about the, you had a pretty good uh, false positive rate when you're extracting the entities. Mm -hmm. might be a bit more difficult, but do you have any concept of how many false negatives you got? Oh, uh, we do get a quite... Okay, so when it comes to protein-protein interactions, your network is about 20, let's say 20,000 by 20,000. We suspect currently that only um, about half a million of those are actually... Uh, there's only actually a half a million interactions, so we do expect to get a lot of false negatives. But... Currently, I'm saying that we suspect that there's a half a million. There's really only about a quarter million that we know about. Uh, thanks for very interesting presentation. Um, I'm uh, interested in the representation. Uh, the I want to know the reason why you're using triplet for representation. Uh, is there any limitation of using just triplet? Uh. Yeah, well, it, it's, it's a good place to start. I, I don't think in any way that you would think that triplet is a complete representation. In fact, um, we know it's showing it's like we have quite complex sentences, and really these interactions lead to things that we call biological processes. And so really often there's kind of a 
fourth or fifth feature that goes along with the relationship, whether it might be something that happens upstream or downstream. So that, and so yes, that, that, that is something we're considering is how you add that to the oh, Thank you very much. So you will extend the representation and uh, you expect to uh, use, use free information from articles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, no, definitely we'll have to, uh, I'm assuming as time it comes, goes by, uh, articles will be easier to access. Uh, right now, we, it's, it's a moving target. Thank you. Let's thank our speakers once again.